thank you so much for helping us uh, support and encourage our students uh, to be champions and ambassadors for the humanities. And now uh, I, will, I will introduce to you Walter Scheidel, who is, I'm del absolutely delighted to have him with us tonight. I invited him probably more than a year ago, and, but he understood perfectly well the system and how it works. Uh, you know, so, uh, and then for that, I'm very appreciative. He also took some time off from New York. Off from New York. He's a Guggenheim Fellow this year and uh, he was able to travel a little bit more conveniently uh, to Maine than he would have if he had come from California. So Walter Scheidel is a uh, Dickinson professor in the humanities, professor of classics and history, and Kennedy Grossman Fellow in Human Biology at Stanford University. He has published widely on pre-modern social and economic history, historical demography, and the comparative global history of labor regimes, state formation, and inequality. His latest book, the Great Leveler, Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century was published by Princeton University Press in 2017 and has been translated into a dozen languages. And also, by the way, if some of you, I don't know whether some of you have seen our trailer for this event, it was published on Facebook, uh, and I, I had the I had the pleasure of attending, I don't know whether you heard of this figure, Jordan Peterson, a very prominent in Canadian intellectual who was making a lot of, uh, uh, he's getting a lot of attention in the media. So I went to his talk in New York and the only author he, he cited with a lot of uh, praise and enthusiasm was Scheidel, uh, with Walter Scheidel. And so that is also included in the video trailer that we published on Facebook. So without much further ado, please help me welcome Walter Scheidel to the podium. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for this warm welcome. What I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes is try and really depress you. Uh, with the, rather, people have been telling me the message of my book is supposed to be depressing. I think it's realistic, but you will be the judge of this. To make it easier, I'm going to summarize uh, my thesis on a single slide, which is always helpful. The argument being that if we look at history in as much as we can know it, in the very long run, going back hundreds or sometimes thousands of years, as the evidence permits, every single time we observe a major reduction in economic inequality, by which I mean inequality in the distribution of income and of wealth, every single time it was associated with a major violent shock, a very unpleasant event that destabilized um, the existing order and brought about great suffering, but also greater economic equality. Those shocks came along in four different flavors, which I list on the slide here, mass mobilization, warfare, transformative revolution, state collapse, and epidemics, and I'm going to take you uh, through them. Now, before I do this, I have exactly one slide, mm. trying to explain why there is economic inequality to begin with. Because if you go far back far enough in time, tens of thousands of years uh, during the last ice age or the previous ice ages, everybody on Earth, there weren't that many people, but everybody on Earth was a hunter-gatherer. And people lived in very small groups, 10, 20, 30 people for the most part, as far as we can tell. And there was hardly any economic inequality, as far as we can tell, because everybody was equally poor. People then didn't produce very much. They were not sedentary. They had to move around. So whatever they would have produced, they would have had to carry with them uh, all the time. And they were quite aggressively egalitarian, as the few surviving foraging populations are in uh, the world today. Of course, once the last ice age ended and the Holocene uh, set in about 13,000 years ago or thereabouts, and people started to settle down, farm the land, domesticate animals, all this changed because now all of a sudden people possessed material resources that allowed economic inequality to arise. And in addition, because people are very crafty, they've always had big brains, they also invented institutions, norms and regulations that made it possible for them to own property and to pass it on to future generations. And if, if you start out from a 
perfectly egalitarian situation. Everybody has the same amount of stuff. If you wait long enough, automatically inequality is going to arise. And then, of course, in addition, people invented the state. They invented political power, hierarchical stratified systems that acted almost as engines of disequalization that reinforced this trend towards greater and greater inequality. And that pretty much describes most of human history. So it's fair to say that if we look at history in a very long run, inequality is a default. And what's really interesting is not so much why does inequality arise, the sources change over time, but it's always uh, almost a default um, outcome. The question is, why does it at least at times uh, go down quite dramatically? And that's what I try to capture in my book. <clears throat> now I'm going to start with the last two uh, mechanisms on my list because they're the ones who used to be the most common in history. They're the ones that used to be active all the way up to the 19th century. Uh, in the hundreds and thousands of years uh, before uh, the industrial age, their state collapse and very severe epidemics. Now, you might ask, why do these factors reduce economic inequality? In both cases, the answer is surprisingly simple. As I already mentioned, states for thousands of years were not very nice entities um, to deal with. They were openly unfair, hierarchical, stratified, predatory, exploitative. They benefited the few at the expense of the many. There were benefits for the many as well in terms of security uh, and so on. But the rich, the powerful, certainly benefited disproportionately. And for the most part, the rich and the powerful were either the same group of people or they were very closely allied. And that's true of pretty much any pre-modern historical society um, you look at. Now, if that is true, then the bigger those states became, the longer they lasted, the more powerful they became, the more inequality uh, they were going to support. If you had really large empires, like the Roman Empire and so on, the richer its ruling class uh, became. And we can actually track this reasonably well in the historical record. Now, if that is true, then logically the inverse, the opposite, must also be true. Whenever those state structures unraveled because of some shock, some war, some collapse event, some environmental uh, shock, which happened quite frequently in the pre-modern period, well, everybody was going to suffer. State collapse is not a fun experience for anybody, but the rich simply had more to lose. If you're poor and you lose more than a certain fraction of your income, you're going to starve to death. You're no longer going to be part of the statistic. If you're rich, you can lose 99% of your property and still be around. And in fact, that's what we observe in many cases going back literally thousands of years to Pharaonic Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, you name it. Um, I just mentioned a few examples, the collapse of uh, Bronze Age civilization around 1200 BC in the Aegean, more famously the fall of the Roman Empire, the fall of the classic lowland Maya civilization in Yucatan, uh, the fall of various Chinese dynasties, uh, the fall of the Angkorian Empire, some of you will have been in Cambodia, maybe seen uh, those sites at least on TV or in movies. Uh, in all those events, uh, very mighty states crumbled and took the ruling class of the day with them. There was a great deal of suffering, but a great deal of compression occurred as well. The rich were no longer nearly as rich compared to everybody else than they used to be before. Most recent example, in fact, is Somalia. Uh, Somalia always gets a bad press because of state collapse, anarchy in the 80s and 90s. It's a terrible situation, but almost perversely, what happened in Somalia was that the kleptocracy that used to be in charge was destroyed, and even though anarchy went up, economic inequality uh, went down as a result, as far as we can tell, because the uppermost uh, wealth elite uh, disappeared as a result. So these are always very unpleasant events, but they happen to reduce inequality uh, quite dependably. Now, I just put on this one slide to also give you an idea of how we actually know these things. Because you might ask, how is it possible to measure Measures the wrong word. Estimate uh, economic inequality hundreds of thousands of years ago. There were no statistics, the kind of data that we are used to today. So we have to be very uh, inventive uh, in order to tease information out of various proxies, of very disparate uh, types of source material. That's one example that shows the, the Gini coefficient, which is a standard metric of inequality. Higher the Gini coefficient is, the more inequality there is in a given system, a given population. Um, looking at uh, the distribution of house sizes in Britain before, during, and after the Roman conquest. 
before the Romans came along, people were all more or less equally poor. Britain becomes part of the Roman Empire about 2,000 years ago. All of a sudden, there's a great deal of dispersion. Most people are still poor, but some live in big mansions because they're part of a larger imperial ruling class. Roman Empire falls apart about 1,600 years ago. Everything goes back to pretty much the way it was um, before. So that's just one example of how we um, throw light on these issues. What about very serious epidemics? Now, here it's important to bear in mind that prior to the 19th century, 20th century in many cases, most historical societies were agrarian societies, but most people would farm the land. And land was a very important determinant. Control over land was a very important determinant of economic inequality. A very few times in history, Epidemic disease waves are swept across entire continents, most famously or infamously the Black Death, bubonic plague at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, pandemics here in the New World, when Europeans showed up for the first time, they introduced Old World infectious diseases, measles, smallpox, uh, influenza, uh, wiping out a large percentage of the indigenous uh, population across the Americas. Early examples like a first appearance of bubonic plague at the end of antiquity. These events are mercifully very, very rare, but what they had in common is that every single time uh, they happened, they also killed tens of millions of people. They were truly catastrophic. Uh, events, but they also greatly reduced economic inequality. Why would they do that? They would do that because they would kill off, let's say, a third or half of the population uh, of a given society without destroying the physical infrastructure. And all of a sudden, the supply of labor uh, went down, and the supply of other of capital and other endowments stayed the same. So the people who had to sell their labor, which is most people, the working population, was better off than before because they could sell their labor for higher uh, wages. And those people who controlled the means of production, land, other forms of uh, productive wealth, capital, well, they lost out because all of a sudden their wealth, their assets were worth less. So the rich were less rich, and the poor were less poor. Uh, we can illustrate this a better or, or more in, in, in sort of more precisely with the help of statistics uh, than uh, the effects of state collapse. This is one example uh, looking at rural real wages, uh, wages earned by agricultural laborers in England before, during, and after uh, the Black Death, um, adjusted for uh, the cost of living. And here you can see in the high middle ages, people are very, very poor. They just make enough to be able to work X hours a day and not starve, or maybe have a few children, and that's about it. They live in very destitute conditions. Plague comes in, kills half of all people in England uh, in the late Middle Ages, and real incomes go up about 150%. And if you're very, very poor, having your income go up in real terms by 150% makes an enormous difference. And we can see this in the record. Uh, people eat better, they dress better, they have better housing. They are simply much better off than before. Eventually, around 1500, plague goes away, population recovers, population growth uh, sets in, and gradually uh, the working poor uh, lose their additional purchasing power. And if you wait long enough, uh, you are back to where uh, you came from. We have multiple uh, ways of um, attesting this. Um, this is ongoing research, really, because of um, simply because inequality is now such a big deal in contemporary society, not just in the US, but in Europe uh, and elsewhere. A great deal of new research is being done uh, trying to figure out whether there are broader trends uh, visible in the past. That's a result of this new research. People go to city archives in Italy. Italian cities never threw anything away. There are city archives going back 700 years with the documents still sitting there, uh, readable if you have the appropriate uh, skills. Um, even back then, uh, fortunes were being assessed so the rich, rich could be taxed, their wealth uh, could be uh, taxed. Those records survive, and they allow us to calculate that indeed that the, the, the degree of concentration of wealth was very high before the Black Death. It went down in the 15th century during the Black Death, and then it recovered eventually to even higher levels uh, than before. So in the absence of those violent shocks, inequality is highly uh, resilient. One more example uh, from the New World, a similar kind of situation. Well, when the Spanish come in, they conquer Mexico, 
Uh, real wages of workers, uh, they're treated very poorly, they are held in conditions of serfdom, they're heavily coerced to work, income is very, very low. But eventually so many people die in Mexico that employers, landlords have to pay higher wages and real incomes go up several times uh, in the early modern period until those plagues subside um, and um, the original conditions reassert themselves. Now, both of these uh, factors uh, were not particularly common, but well attested uh, in the pre-industrial period. Now, from about 1900 onwards, things changed. We no longer, at least in the West, we no longer live in agrarian um, societies. And really, the Spanish flu at the end of World War I was the last really major uh, global epidemic, and not nearly as bad as the Black Death in relative terms. What happened in the 20th century is that those two factors, state collapse and pandemics, were effectively replaced by two others, which I call mass mobilization warfare and transformative revolution, which are, you could argue, almost the same. They are very closely genetically uh, related because they're rooted in the same um, upheavals. Now, when I say mesmerization warfare, I mean World War I and especially World War II, the first time in history where you have uh, an extremely intense form of warfare where a large percentage of the population is mobilized, either serves in the military or in the war um, industry, uh, where um, all kinds of uh, measures are being taken in, an industry, in the context of industrialization and the modern nation state. That turns out reduces inequality uh, quite efficiently. I'll show you, I'll show you just a, a couple of um, examples. Uh, those lines show the, uh, the share of all income in a variety of countries, US, France, Canada, and Japan, uh, earned by the highest earning 1% uh, of the population. The famous 1%, that's a, a buzzword now, right, signifying uh, people at the very top of the distribution, they were really, really rich. Uh, right before World War II, in all of these countries, the highest earning 1% earned about 20% of all income, which of course is the same situation as in the US right now, but it took us a long time uh, to get back to this. What happens in just a few years is, right during World War II, is that their share plummets dramatically by half, by two thirds in some cases, and then stays more or less stable for about a generation till it starts rising again uh, from the 1980s onwards, at least uh, in the US in particular. Same is true of the concentration of wealth. Here we can go back further in time because as I already mentioned, we have documentation in many countries tracking private wealth over hundreds of years because wealth used to be taxed much earlier uh, than income. Income tax is mostly a 20th century phenomenon. And here we see in many countries in the 18th and the 19th century, uh, the share of all private wealth held by the richest 1% of the population, well, it was pretty high, and the tendency is up. There's a gentle upward slope uh, for most of these countries, peaking at the beginning of the 20th century. And what happens between 1914 and the middle of the 20th century is that the degree of concentration of wealth uh, goes down quite uh, dramatically, and then again recovers, stabilizes in the last uh, 30 or 40 years or so. That's the same phenomenon as for income. Why did this happen? It happened because any number of factors directly related to World War I and World War II uh, happened at the same time. Not in identical fashion in all countries. It makes a difference if you're in the US or in Japan or in Germany. So not all of these factors always applied simultaneously in, in quite the same way. But ideal, typically, that's, those are the main results uh, of the war. What happened was that capital investments, capital holdings, lost a great deal of value, partly because of interruptions to the global economy brought about by the wars, and mostly because of government intervention in the private sector. Governments had to put their economies on a war footing in order to fund uh, war efforts on an unprecedented uh, scale to pay for these things and organize uh, them in an effective way. As a result of this, taxes went up to very high levels. Famously, the top uh, income tax rate in the US in the early 40s was 94% which would be rather unthinkable uh, today or in any country uh, in peacetime. The top estate tax rate in the US was 70%. So it was not a very good idea if you were rich uh, to die uh, at that time because your heirs would <laughs> lose most of the estate. 
that was necessary to pay uh, for the war. The money had to go somewhere. The money, much of it was actually given uh, to the working population, right, to sustain uh, the war effort. This was effectively a massive redistribution of resources from the rich to everybody else. Because there was full employment, because of conscription and uh, war industry, there was enormous demand for unskilled labor. And so the, the, what is known as the skill premium, the extra money you get to earn if you have higher education, if you have a high school diploma, an academic degree, that dropped as well. There was less demand, relatively speaking, for higher educated people, more demand uh, for lower educated people, and that reduces wage inequality uh, quite um, effectively. Many countries, not the US, not Britain, but pretty much everybody else, suffered massive inflation because governments printed a lot of money uh, to pay for the war effort. And then, of course, that would wipe out uh, bank assets, uh, cash-nominated assets, and so on. And of course, again, in many countries, not the US, but pretty much everywhere else, there was massive physical uh, destruction. Not just killing lots of people, but destroying housing stock, factories, shipping, which again was predominantly owned by the rich. And there was never any real compensation uh, for those losses in many cases. So if you take all of these factors together, it's not hard to understand why these wars had a massively equalizing um, effect. I'll just show you a single illustration because it captures this um, transformation uh, quite nicely. This is the average top tax rate on income in blue and on estates, on inheritances in orange, averaged across 20 Western countries. And you can see in the 19th century, taxes either didn't exist or they are so low you can't distinguish them uh, from zero. They shoot up during World War I, because all of a sudden governments need to make a lot of money, go down a bit in the interwar period and reach their secular high in the 1940s, uh, right during World War II, and on average have been going down ever since. This is not just a phenomenon of the Reagan era, what people always mention. They started sliding down already from the late 1940s onwards because the pressure of war uh, was gradually taken out um, of the um, equation. Now, in addition to all of this, there are second-order effects, knock-on effects. Democratization. Um, there was a huge expansion in formal voting rights right after World War I when women got the vote uh, in the US and many other countries too, Britain and so on, and in other countries like France after World War II. Uh, uh, membership in labor unions, which has a strong equalizing effect on wages in particular because of collective bargaining, uh, went up explosively. And the welfare state as we know it is very much rooted in the fiscal expansion of uh, the Second World War and the increase in governmental uh, organizational capacity. And the last item is a bit more difficult to measure, but it appears that, of course, the war also affected people's attitudes, their behavior, their expectations, the expectation that shared suffering should now be rewarded by, say, welfare programs. Uh, the idea was we're all in this uh, together. There are some metrics that would show that social solidarity increased uh, as a result of these dramatic shocks. Again, I'll just show you one uh, illustration uh, how uh, membership, the rate of membership in trade unions and labor unions changed as a result of these events. Labor union membership was very low uh, in the late 19th century. Um, it goes up uh, dramatically uh, during World War I, falls back down in the interwar period, and peaks in many, not in all countries, but certainly in the US and many other cases, around 1945, and then either stabilizes or goes down. Again, there are very few outliers, uh, mostly in Scandinavia. So even those developments are very much driven uh, by mass mobilization, warfare. Question is, of course, for me as a, as a global historian, uh, were there earlier instances uh, of leveling of uh, equalization associated with mass mobilization warfare? Very short answer, which is all I have time for, is hardly ever. History is full of wars. You open any history textbook, it's one war after the other. They don't have a systematic effect uh, on inequality. Not even remarkably the Civil War. You would think that the Civil War in the US made a difference. It did in the South. Uh, uh, abolition of slavery, of course, um, impoverishes to some extent uh, the plantation owners. But at the same time, rich people in the North and the Union became much richer than they were before because of government uh, contracts, profiteering, uh, tax rates were very, very low. And if you look at the country overall, it's a wash. 
Inequality goes down a bit in the south, it goes up in the north, but on average, it stayed up the same. What about civil war? Civil war, merciful, is very rare. In modern societies, the most recent example we have of a fully-fledged civil war, uh, excepting uh, Yugoslavia, is the Spanish civil war in the 1930s, where, in fact, inequality did go down, as far as we can tell. Now, of course, uh, civil wars mostly occur in developing countries. And here, they tend not to reduce, but, if anything, increase uh, inequality, because in those cases, you have small groups of people who, again, benefit uh, disproportionately by uncontrolled profiteering. Uh, redistribution by the state is weakened. Uh, the poor suffer because they can't bring their products uh, to market and so on. So we have to be very specific. We can't say war reduces inequality. Most wars don't. Very, very specific circumstances had to apply in World War I and especially World War II to bring about this overall effect. What about revolution? Well, here I can be very short. Uh, communist revolutions starting in 1917 uh, in Russia, well, they are deliberately uh, equalizing. You have communists, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, uh, various spin-off regimes going out saying, we have to reduce uh, inequality, among other things. They also say we have to kill lots of people uh, in the process to make this happen. This is, these are very bloody uh, transformative events. The body count is ultimately about the same as for the two world wars. But of course, economic inequality did go down. Unsurprisingly, if you expropriate the rich, if you um, uh, redistribute land and then collectivize it, if you nationalize industry, capital, if you have a planned economy where the government sets all prices and wages, you are not going to have a great deal of economic inequality. And the extent to which it still exists will be determined uh, by the regime in charge. And so unsurprisingly, in the Soviet Union, in Mao's China, in Vietnam, Cambodia, under the Khmer Rouge, in Fidel's uh, Cuba in better times, uh, inequality was very, very low indeed. Now, the moment these regimes fell or effectively gave up uh, on communism, all this changed. Inequality in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union doubled uh, within just a few years. It has doubled in China over a longer period of time. It is very high now in Vietnam. It's even higher in Cuba, which is officially still a communist country, but not really. Uh, there's a great deal of inequality uh, visible even there. So this type of inequality can only be maintained uh, if you have hardcore communist regimes in place with all the social, all the human costs uh, this entails. Are there earlier cases of similarly equalizing uh, revolutions? Not really. You might think of the French Revolution. You have aristocrats getting their heads chopped off and that sort of thing. Um, there was um, some expropriation, some redistribution, but nothing on the scale of what you observe on the communist regimes, which is not surprising, because the French Revolution is a bourgeois, it's a middle class revolution, not nearly as radical as anything that happened uh, in the 20th century. And before that, well, there are lots and lots of rebellions in world history, peasant uprisings and so on, but they are invariably crushed by the rich because they're just better organized. So for most of history, as I said, these are the four factors that have really demonstrably uh, reduced uh, economic inequality, which of course immediately raises a rather obvious question. Are there any peaceful alternatives that can be shown to have had uh, a similar kind of impact on the distribution of income and wealth? And I devote an entire section in my book to this question because I didn't just want to cherry pick. I didn't just want to document those cases that fit my thesis. I actively tried to find uh, counterexamples uh, that would um, open up uh, credible alternatives. I wasn't terribly successful. For most of history, of course, as, as I said earlier, uh, most historical societies are agrarian societies. If you live in an agrarian society, who controls the land is the single most important predictor of inequality. And there are many, many, many cases, I couldn't possibly count them, surely hundreds if not more in history, of land reform. Schemes of redistribution, where the rich had to give up some of their land and the land was redistributed to the poor, so they would have their own farmsteads and so on. And it turns out, if you look at this systematically and globally, the more peaceful, the more orderly, the less bloody these land reforms were, the less well they worked in the long term. The more bl the bloodier they were, the more disorderly they were, the better they worked in terms of equalization. It's very easy to understand because if you just take 
In many cases, uh, owners were compensated. If you compensate the owners for the land that's taken away from them, and you give land uh, to poor farmers who may not have the right experience, the right equipment, uh, capital uh, to farm the land, they're going to fall into debt and a generation down, they may sell the land back to the, the former landlords. And they are back to where they were. And the landlords are even richer than before because first they got compensated and then they bought back uh, the land. The bloodier these reforms are, the better uh, they tend to work. Of course, most extreme examples were the communist uh, upheavals I already referenced. There are other examples. Think of land reform in the wake of World War II, South Korea, Taiwan, fear of communism, a drove, pretty effective reform. Uh, there was a lot of reforming going on in Latin America after Fidel came to power, because all of a sudden regimes all over Latin America thought this could happen to us. And the State Department and the CIA would go down to Latin American countries and say, you have to reform, right? There has to, something needs to happen. So whenever you have a credible threat of violent upheaval, it doesn't actually have to happen. But as long as there's a credible threat, this works reasonably uh, well. What about financial crises? There have been many financial crises, uh, most, well, quite recently, uh, about a decade ago. We know what happened during the Great Recession, 2007, 8, 9, 10. Uh, the rich, temporarily in the US for three or four years, became a little less rich relative to everybody else than they had been before, and then recovered very, very quickly. There was exposure to risky investments, and it took a few years for that to recover, but recover uh, they did. Of course, there are still plenty of people with underwater mortgages and so on who did not uh, recover in quite the same way. In fact, if you look at this systematically, some economists have looked at over 100 financial and macroeconomic crises over more than 100 years. There is no systematic effect of those events on inequality. More often than not, they don't uh, reduce inequality at all. I have to say the Great Depression in the US is a partial exception, and a very rare exception, because the depression was so severe uh, and uh, then, of course, coupled uh, with the reforms of the New Deal, that, in fact, measurably income and wealth inequality did go down uh, in uh, the 1930s. But most of this, remarkably, predates the New Deal. You'd think the New Deal would have had a bigger effect on this than the actual uh, crisis of 1929 and the immediately following years. That doesn't seem to be the case. And in the end, it's really World War II that made uh, the biggest difference. So we can't really tell how this would have uh, played out in the longer term had World War II not come along. But even that is a very rare exception uh, to a broader pattern. What about democracy? You might think, well, the more democratic societies become, the better uh, people will be able to do something about economic inequality. People are going to vote for politicians, for programs uh, that are going to uh, reduce economic inequality because it's in the, in the interest of the famous median uh, voter, the majority uh, of voters. As we know, that doesn't always seem to happen. Uh, in fact, if you look at democracy globally, again, in the long run, across many different countries, there is no consistent effect. Yes, in some cases, democratization reduces inequality. In others, it doesn't. There are so many different flavors of democracy out there, two-party systems, multi-party systems, democracies in developing countries, uh, and so on and so forth, different cultural uh, effects confounding this. There is simply no consistent effect, not even remarkably, it seems, for um, you know, right or left. You would think if you have, you know, left-leaning parties uh, in power, that would have a measurable effect as opposed to right-leaning uh, parties in power doesn't, again, on average, doesn't really seem to be the case, which is quite remarkable. So that's not uh, a panacea, not an easy solution either. What about membership in labor unions? That does have an effect on inequality. The larger the percentage of the workforce organized in unions, the lower income inequality, especially wage inequality, is going to be. That's almost inevitable. But as I tried to show earlier, we can't treat unionization as an independent variable, something that just happens for unrelated reasons, union membership was very heavily mediated by World War I and uh, World War II. There are other factors, too, the rise and fall of manufacturing. But really, the mass mobilization wars were vital in driving up uh, rates of union membership. So again, there is a very meaningful link uh, to large-scale violence. That leaves us with two more uh, candidates, which I call somewhat tongue-in-cheek the economists' uh, favorites. One is the idea 
uh, that economic development in and of itself, if you just let it run its course and you wait long enough, is going to reduce economic inequality. That's a very nice story. Uh, people believed this to be true in the 50s and 60s and 70s because that's what seemed to be happening. After the war, there was massive economic growth, expansion of the middle class, and economic inequality was low or even uh, going down uh, further. It's known as the Kuznets curve, um, named after uh, economist uh, Simon Kuznets, who came up with this idea uh, back in the 50s and got a Nobel Prize for this in the 70s. And right after it collected the Nobel Prize, uh, inequality started going up uh, in pretty much all uh, developed countries. So there's something uh, wrong with this assumption. We now know we have so many more data than were available at the time. And again, if you look at this systematically, globally, this effect simply doesn't exist. If you wait for economic growth to fix the problem of economic inequality, you are going to wait for a very long time. Uh, this, this relationship simply doesn't exist in this particular way. Last candidate is what is known as the race between education and technology. The idea being technology changes all the time and ever more rapidly. And so the provision of education has to keep up with this change, right? Uh, people have to be trained in order to be able to uh, uh, sort of not be left behind. If education fails to do this um, uh, broadly, then a few people will be in a much better position to um, capitalize on technological change, and others who don't have the right education are going to be left behind. And so it's up to the, educational, the education sector uh, to, to address uh, this issue. And so the idea is the better education is, the better education works in this respect, the less income inequality you're going to have in the long term. Now, very broadly speaking, that's certainly true. If you had less education in the world today, in the US and other countries, inequality would be even higher than it is. That's undeniably true. But remarkably, and again, as I already mentioned earlier, uh, mass mobilization warfare had a really strong effect on this. If you look at the US in the 20th century, 100% of the net reduction in the skill premium, the extra income earned by people with higher degrees, 100% uh, of this decline happened right during and after World War I and during World War II. There hasn't been any such reduction after 1945, as far as we can tell. So even in those cases, uh, the, the effect of education is very heavily shaped uh, by these violent shocks. So that's my conclusion then, in a way, that if we look at uh, world history in the long term, it is fair to say that uh, evolution of economic inequality is the result of an interplay between processes of wealth and, wealth and income concentration driven by any number of things, state formation early on, economic development, industrialization, post-industrial uh, developments, any number of things that interact with occasional violent shocks that reduce uh, rising or high uh, inequality. And if you look at history in a very, very long term, you see almost what I call super curves or waves where levels of inequality go up or down. We can track this best in Europe simply because most research has been done uh, on Europe. We can track this back 9,000 years. What happened in Europe 9,000 years ago, agriculture shows up for the first time. And it spreads through Europe over thousands of years, from the southeast all the way up to you know, Britain and Ireland and Scandinavia and so on. And as it does, inequality goes up as well, for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, culminating ultimately in the Roman Empire. Roman Empire 2,000 years ago rules about 80% of all people in Europe. It is a highly uh, stratified, hierarchical, pretty nasty uh, system with an ultra-rich uh, ruling class that owns assets all over the Mediterranean basin, lots of slaves, lots of poor people, an extreme degree of inequality. Then the Roman Empire falls apart. Uh, 100 years later, plague appears for the first time, and a double blow destabilizes society, but it also reduces uh, e uh, economic inequality quite dramatically. Uh, conditions, there's a recovery in the high Middle Ages. By 1300, you're pretty much back to where you were in the Roman period. You have a feudal nobility, people in their castles, they're very, very rich, lots of starving peasants. Black death comes in, kills a third of all people in Europe, real wages go up, capital value goes down. By 1500, plague goes away. And for the next 400 years, 
before and during the Industrial Revolution, inequality almost everywhere where we have sources are tended to go up. And it went up and up and up. And by 1913 or thereabouts, in many countries like Britain, uh, had reached the highest level uh, recorded in history. And then you, ha you have what is known as the Great Compression, World War I, Great Depression, uh, World War II, where inequality goes down dramatically. And at the very end, you see uh, the more recent um, upturn, which is modest like this in some countries, less modest uh, in the United States and some other Anglophone countries. You can do the same for Latin America, where, of course, we, can, we can't trace this process back quite uh, far, uh, as far in time. You can trace it back to the Aztec and Inca empires in the 15th century. Already pretty unequal. Spanish conquistadors come in, take over the Americas in the 16th century, re uh, increase inequality even further uh, by mostly uh, assigning themselves enormous estates, tens of thousands of serfs. There's an extreme degree of inequality as a result of this. Then you have the impact of population loss because of all the pandemics uh, that occur. Uh, through the introduction of European diseases, which probably reduced inequality. But by the time the dust settles, by the 18th century, uh, before many of those countries broke away from Spain and Portugal, or <laughs> the US broke away uh, from Britain, on the, what we call, call mature colonial empire, the new world is super unequal. There are some people who own all the land, who have plantations, lots of slaves. The indigenous population, mostly poor. Slaves are poor. Many immigrants are poor. It's a very, very uh, unequal society. The wars of independence in Latin America, in particular, independence from Spain, uh, reduces this. And then from about the 1860s, 70s onwards, as Latin America becomes properly integrated in the industrializing uh, Western economy, economic inequality goes up and up and up because there are some people who control uh, the staples, uh, the minerals, or the plantation products that are being sold uh, to uh, industrializing countries, and everybody else is more or less left behind. It's only very recently, after about 2000, that we have a spell of peaceful equalization in many Latin American countries, which is heartening. But again, even this trend has already run into difficulties because of economic uh, headwinds, political pushback, uh, if you think of Brazil, uh, uh, and so on. So it's not clear how sustainable this is going to be in the long term. Finally, the US. US was not very unequal in the colonial period. Not surprising. Uh, low population uh, density, uh, abundance of land. There is no established, entrenched aristocracy uh, like in Europe. So uh, wealth and income differences weren't really all that dramatic. War of independence probably reduces inequality a little bit because some rich people who sympathize with Britain uh, left the country or, or lost some of their assets. But after that, inequality goes down, uh, goes up quite continuously uh, with economic development. As I already said, the Civil War was a wash. Inequality goes up in the north, goes down in the south. Inequality really peaks in the, in the roaring 20s. In the 1920s, 1929, I guess, has the highest uh, recorded rates of economic inequality in the country. Then you have the Great Depression and New Deal, and especially World War II, with the attendant reduction in inequality. And then from the 1980s onwards, uh, a very strong return of income and wealth inequality, which is, to some extent, still ongoing. This brings me to my final question, because in the, in the title of my talk, I was promised to talk about the future. And of course, the question is, where do we go from here? Short answer is we don't know, because history can't predict the future. It can give us a sense, however, of what was common in history, what wasn't common in history, what's easy to do, what's hard to do. And it would be kind of foolish to assume that these rules no longer apply. So while history can't really predict exactly what's going to happen, it gives us a pretty good sense of what is more likely to happen uh, than other things. Now, the basic facts are pretty clear. In many countries, inequality has been rising now for several decades. In virtually all uh, Western countries, in post-communist countries, uh, in other very large countries, uh, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, that hold a very large percentage uh, of the world population. At the same time, the traditionally effective equalizing mechanisms, my four horsemen of the apocalypse, listed up once again, they are not currently active, which is a very good thing. I mean, I don't think anybody wants another world war. 
Very few people, I think, want another communist or equivalent revolution. Nobody wants the state collapse. Well, some people, I guess, do, but not very many people want complete state collapse. Nobody wants a, a big epidemic. These things are not likely to happen. If there's another big war, it would be very different from World War I, World War II. It would be a high-tech cyber war uh, with very different uh, effects, arguably. There are currently no credible revolutionaries on the horizon trying to take over uh, large countries. States in most of the world have become much more resilient than they used to be. State collapse is now a phenomenon of tropical Africa, uh, parts of the Middle East, but not really beyond that. An epidemic could happen tomorrow in principle. There could be an unbelievably horrible uh, new epidemic happening. Um, thanks to uh, a progress in genetics, we are arguably ever better equipped to deal with this. So there is at least some reason uh, for hope. None of these things is currently going on. And they're not likely to happen, uh, very likely to happen anytime soon, nor, of course, would we want them uh, to be. Now, what does that mean for programs to reduce economic uh, inequality? There is no shortage of plausible policy measures. Entire books are being published by Nobel Prize winning economists having long lists of recipes, all the things that would need to be done in order to reduce inequality of income and wealth. Targeted fiscal intervention, i.e. tax the rich more, uh, better investment in education, uh, cracking down on concealed wealth, offshore wealth, tax evasion, providing a basic income. Campaign finance reform in the US would be a start to reduce the uh, influence of the plutocracy. Any number of things. Long lists have been developed. And it's certainly true that if all these measures were implemented, they would greatly reduce economic inequality. What's missing from those discussions is usually the, the pesky little detail of implementation feasibility uh, from the political angle. Under what conditions are such measures actually plausible? Under what conditions are they likely uh, to be enacted? We know they can be very easily enacted if a, a very major shock occurs. If there's the Great Depression, if there is a world war, then all of a sudden things become possible that would not otherwise be possible politically. It doesn't really do to look back 50 years and said, well, people back then did X, Y, and Z. And if only we could also do X, Y, and Z again, everything would be fine, because the world has changed. We operate in a very, uh, very different uh, environment, a globalized environment. It's no longer the post-war uh, period. We no longer have protectionism, uh, all the various things, all the regulation that were in place uh, at the time. At the same time, there are a number of trends visible quite clearly uh, at this point that are more likely to raise than to reduce economic inequality. One is globalization which has lifted vast numbers of people out of poverty in developing countries, which is a very good thing. It just so happens that it tends to hurt certain segments of the workforce uh, in, um, in developed countries, and also tends to increase overall inequality in developing countries. Yes, the poor are less poor, and that's extremely important, but the rich become disproportionately richer uh, than they were before. Things we see in China, India, uh, post-communist countries, and so on. Automation, that's a truly open-ended process. Nobody has any clue, really, uh, what this is going to do in the longer term, artificial intelligence, robots, and so on. What we do know is that automation tends to hollow out labor markets by destroying more and more mid-level uh, professions and jobs, rewarding people at the very top, leaving a lot of space for low-skill, low-wage uh, employment, but less uh, in the middle, which accounts uh, for some of the shrinking of the middle class uh, that has been observed in the US and elsewhere. The other phenomena, like secular aging, we already know that populations uh, farther down the line a few decades out are going to be much older on average than populations today because of the aging baby boomers and the reduction uh, in fertility. Not so much in the US, but certainly in Europe, in Japan, uh, most infamously, eventually uh, in China. That, again, puts great pressure on the welfare state. Unless you keep ra raising taxes higher and higher, which isn't really feasible uh, either in many cases, you're going to have to spend more resources on caring for the elderly, uh, health care, and less on more aggressively redistributive programs. That's a zero-sum game. And arguably, we already see the effect of this uh, in Japan and maybe South Korea, uh, uh, where the, um, uh, the elderly are taken care of less well uh, than they might be. Um, this, of course, is then offset by migration. 
which is uh, a very a sort of explosive uh, issue to uh, discuss in full swing in the US, uh, certainly uh, increasingly a big deal um, in Europe. The idea being you have to bring in millions and millions and millions of extra people in order to offset uh, the secular aging of the existing population. Well, it turns out if you look at, if you undertake surveys in the most ex exposed countries like Europe, um, and you ask people, well, if there were more people from different cultures, right, who are ethnically different, religiously different from you, speak very different languages, hold different religious beliefs, would you still support paying very high taxes if more of this money goes to those immigrants? And people say, no, I would not, in fact, support this. So we are very much at the beginning, but we can't, it's, it's difficult to gauge how serious this effect is going to be, but it is likely uh, to, uh, again, disrupt uh, the established welfare system as well. And of course, the final frontier this is still science fiction, but you know, we're in the 21st century. If you wait long enough, it's bound to happen one way or another. At least at this point, we only have economic inequality among actual people. What if you have genetic modification? With uh, gene editing, it's already in full swing. Uh, every day you have a new uh, report of what can now be done. Uh, designer babies, they are in the future. Geneticists will say, this is really difficult to do. This, you know, don't worry about it. No geneticist is going to say this will never happen, because that would not be quite uh, sincere. And it doesn't have to be genetic modification. It can be cybernetic implants, hooking people up to all kinds of devices uh, and information streams and so on. And at least initially will be available only only to people in rich countries and to rich people in rich countries. And there are 200 countries in the world. Even if you outlaw it in some Western countries, someone somewhere is going to offer uh, those services. And of course, then you can have really dystopian scenarios where the rich and powerful are not just rich and powerful, they are different from everybody else. And they will pass on this difference maybe even uh, to their children. Now that's still, of course, science fiction, but it's arguably on the horizon. For the time being, we have all these other uh, forces and factors to contend with. So the conclusion is really, there isn't a great deal of reason for optimism in a way. In theory, we have an idea of what might work in practice, especially in the US. It's very hard to see how this could be successfully implemented, successfully enacted against the background of a world in which all these disequalizing uh, factors are um, at work. So it may well be that we are simply entering another phase, another period of prolonged increasing inequality as we did in the 19th century, the 18th century, the 17th century. Uh, before that, and it might conceivably, I hope not, but conceivably take some violent shock that we cannot even yet uh, imagine uh, to really change uh, this picture. I hope that's not true, but that seems to be the message uh, that history supports. And with this, I, I promised you a pessimistic message, so I hope I um, <laughs> delivered uh, for the time being. So I just wanted to thank you for your attention. I'm, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.